Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today I'm very excited to have Aaron Alexander with us. Aaron is a manual therapist, movement coach, and author, as well as the host of the Align Podcast, ranked number one in nutrition on Apple Podcasts. Aaron has helped the world's top athletes and celebrities and everyone in between relieve their physical and mental pain, and he's here to help you too. After working with clients and spending years traveling around the world, being immersed in various cultures, he's come to the conclusion that the healthiest people are not from gym cultures. Instead, they utilize each moment as an opportunity to move their body, strengthen their mind, and live holistically. Aaron, it's so great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. So we met at an event uh, run by our uh, good friends uh, who, who started Two Soul, the smoothie, healthy uh, lifestyle uh, brands, and I just wanted to, first of all, give them a shout out. So Two Soul is such an, an amazing uh, new product, and I have some, I'm actually recording this from Tel Aviv right now, and we brought some uh, Two Soul uh, smoothies with us, <laughs> so we'll be able to enjoy them here in, in Israel. So, um, how how have you gotten to to know the the folks at Two Soul? How do I? Well, I guess through Neil Strauss originally. I reached out to him through yeah. mutual friends to have him on my podcast uh, like years ago, and then ended up connecting with Ingrid. And you know, I was like super surprised and impressed how congruent our perspectives were on many things. And then we've just become buds through that. Yeah, yeah. Similar situation yeah. for me. I've known Neil for years, met him at a Tim Ferriss event called Opening the Kimono back in 2010, and then I spoke at his second ever um, society intensive, and then I joined the society after that, been in it for, I don't know, seven years or more, and then, um, of course, through that, met Ingrid, and yeah. Uh, yeah, helped uh, support them with their launch, gave them some SEO advice and some internet marketing advice and yeah, they're doing great. So, um, what a great I, name, the society sounds so mysterious. It, it does. Like, I yeah. Like, it, you know. what's, it's ironic that it's a secret society that has a website that kind of doesn't seem to jive. I don't know, but anyways, right, yeah, right. it's a great, right. uh, it's a great group. I've, I've really yeah. enjoyed it anyways. So how do you, um, how do you help somebody who has, I don't know, let's say back trouble or they're not moving enough or they are, um, I don't know, maybe overtraining or whatever the issue is, it's something physical, where do you start and how do you get them back on the path? It, it's, it depends, you know, so there's so many different variables at play with something like that, you know, so just because someone's experiencing pain somewhere in their, their spine or their hip or, you know, anywhere, um, doesn't necessarily, one, certainly doesn't mean that, that the issue is coming directly from that place, um, even if there is some nagging, pulling, compensation or twisting or torquing kind of manifesting itself in that specific area, it doesn't mean that we just need to be drilling down on that spot. Um, and it's, there is also a potential that it could be something that's a bit more like psychosomatic where there's, you know, emotional, mental tension that's contracting said person's nervous system and is creating this signal, this flare saying, I, the bigger I is in pain and I need some, some help. And so pain can express itself in all sorts of very different, interesting places throughout the, the body. And so um, I think the first pl starting place with anything is just having a conversation, you know, and, and you know, checking out, looking into somebody's lifestyle and seeing like, okay, where are you? How do you occupy yourself from a, a mechanical perspective, from a physical perspective? You know, are you in positions that if you were a, the structure of a building, I'd be like, oh, no, 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 like you don't want it to build your structure in that way. You know, gravity pushing down on that building all day long, it's like you're asking for an accident to happen. Um, if that, that's a very easy place to start, and most people can buy that quite easily. It's tangible, it's measurable. Um, and then from there, I think having a conversation of, you know, how is your, the function of your, your mind and your thoughts? Um, you know, if you're in a place where you're continually having this mental, emotional turmoil, 
um, and you feel like the world's out to get you. You feel like you need to be in, in some defense or fight or flight type state because of maybe something happened even before your memories. Maybe something happened you know, that, that caused your nervous system to have the belief that the world's not safe out there. And you haven't really quite gotten over that hump of letting that go because, you know, it, it, it feels like that belief system is still serving you because your organism doesn't want to you know, die. And so it's, it's chronically in that place of batting down the hatches, kind of hunch forward, clench the jaw, clench the fists and kind of get through this thing. You know, so it's, it's, I go from two different seemingly disparate paths, but they are continually circling back with each other. It's kind of like a, like a double helix. They kind of wind back through each other over and over and over again. And you know, I think they're essentially the same path. So how would you find out that somebody had some, let's say, birth trauma or very early childhood trauma? Are you, are you doing kind of uh, hypnotherapy or some sort of regression? No. Or how, how do you figure this out? I'm a, I'm a physical guy. Like that's if like that, all that stuff is beyond my scope. If someone goes into something where it is, you know, I was abused in whatever fashion and, um, you know, I do my damnedest to create a safe space and container for the person to be able to feel whatever it is they need. And, you know, my role is to be an anchor, you know, and beyond that, I'm not really trying to go in as a technician and start tooling their parts. Um, you know, I'd open that up for somebody else. That's like, that's what they've spent their life focusing on. Um, but a lot can happen in a session with somebody just through moving the body. You know, so I do a combination of, um, you know, less these days cause you know, I do the book and I have online programs and various different other things. Um, but I still do actively see clients. It's just much less. And in order to change the body, you know, I use my hands and elbows and kind of movement coaching techniques. Sometimes I'll take them through yoga poses and um, be doing body work with them at that same time. Sometimes it'll be adjusting, you know, we'll do some training stuff that's focusing on kind of reconstituting, reorganizing their body through specific exercises. Um, you know, but I don't, I just let, let be what is during a session. I'm not trying to go in like a technician with specific things and hypnotize anybody or anything like that. I, I focus on the body and a lot of really magical things can happen to the person's um, physical structure and their identity structure simultaneously. In fact, I, mean, I have the belief that you can't really change one without changing the other. You know, so as you move through the world, if you're a person that moves through the world and you're kind of like turtleish. You know, and you've got the forward head posture stuff and your shoulders are kind of rolled forward and maybe you even have like a scoliotic spine pattern where you're kind of your spine kind of wanders left and then wanders right. It's almost like you're trying to hide inside of your own skin in a way. You know, so there's a much higher incidence of, of scoliosis among adolescent girls, you know, which is perhaps there could be some correlation of like their body is going through this really interesting change around that, that time of puberty. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, men are looking at them as like prey animals and their bodies doing all these crazy things. And like, maybe they didn't, weren't even told about what a period is. And it's like, Oh my God, there's like a lot of reason for that, that individual to, to perhaps feel like, Oh, I kind of just want to hide. I don't really want to be seen right now. This feels a little funny. You know, and so there's a, a physical manifestation of a person wanting to hide. I'm not saying this is, you know, it's considered idiopathic. We don't know exactly why that is. Um, so I'm not by no means saying like, this is why it is. Um, but it is interesting. That there is that connection there. And so if a person mentally, emotionally wants to hide, physically, there will be an expression of that. And if you can physically coax that person to come out and express patterns that are a bit more stacked, aligned, balanced, uh, expressive, open, all of those words, then you would in turn end up affecting the way that that person thinks and perceives themselves. They can't not look into the mirror and see a different person at that point or the change just won't happen. You know, so I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like a jack of all trades. I kind of focus on the physical and over the last, you know, 15 years or so of, of doing that, I've just seen it enough that people's people change beyond just their elbows and their shoulders. So I'm like, oh, they're they're connected, right? And and people will uh, supposedly store trauma in different parts of their body, and and if you work on freeing up those body parts, it can free up the trauma. From what I understand, yeah. 
Yeah, so it's a really big conversation, and I don't know that there's a specific place in the body. Like, I don't, I don't have a, a strong sensation of, oh, if you, if there's some fear, then you know, then it's like a liver issue, or if you have mother issues and it's something going on in your kidney or what. I like, I don't have a specific one to one. Okay, you know, here's the the geography, the topography, the map of if this happened in your life, then all of a sudden your elbow is going to express some kind of condition. Um, I don't disagree with that. I just don't. I don't. I haven't like felt that in like a very embodied like oh yeah like that's the way it is, um, but something I can tangibly really like like know and bank on is that when you are scared, I can tell that you're scared. You know, you can tell that somebody's it's not challenging. You know, there's a set, like look at a dog. What's what's a dog do when they they feel like they did something wrong? You yeah. just have the picture in your head. Right, Their tail, tail between wraps under. The, the ears might get oh, they they shrink up. They want to get small. They're not going to be boastful and proud and playful in that moment. You know, that's a different physical, mental, emotional expression. You know, and so when a person gets locked into, okay, what does a person feel like when they are proud? What does a person feel like when they, they feel super safe? What does a person physically express when they feel loved? Like, wow, man, I'm just, ah, man, I'm not worried about anything. Like, I feel just at home. Like, what does that person express in their facial mannerisms and their postural patterns? You're like, oh, okay, like, yeah, like, no problem. I got, I can see that. You know, Paul Ekman is a guy that I've had on my podcast, and he's a, uh, he's studied facial expressions of various different tribes and various different humans all around the world, um, animals as well. And he went and spent a bunch of time in, in Papua New Guinea and, and various places. In fact, I'm planning on going to Papua New Guinea this winter, which is exciting. Uh, we'll see if it's permitted. Um, but what he found out there, was that people's, this was kind of going against Darwin's, uh, Charles Darwin's perspectives, uh, that facial mannerisms, facial gestures, um, the belief was that they are something that's learned. You know, so if you're in New York, you might have slightly different facial gestures than if you're in California or Papua New Guinea. And we found it's like, no, no, this is universal. This is like human DNA stuff. You know, when the human animal feels a certain way, the physical body expresses it a certain way. Obviously, when you get into like, gestures with your hands and stuff you don't like everybody and throw the same gang sign universally um you know that stuff is learned but those there's deep mammalian reptilian reflexes that's just that's a part of the hardware that's millions of years old um you know and so when you can start to tap into that those parts uh it's pretty fascinating man it's, and, it, and the really interesting thing beyond that when you do start to look at that is it really starts to um give you compassion and empathy for other people because you're like, yeah, we're all running on the same switchboard here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when someone's wearing a cool, I wear red, you wear blue, I do this with my hands, I have this like hand signal thing that you don't really understand and sh shake or whatever, that kind of creates a little bit of separation, which is nice because we want to feel like we're part of a tribe, we want to feel like I'm in the society, ooh man, I'm in the, you know, I want to be <laughs> a part of a special, a special group yeah. that makes me feel loved and connected and tribal and you know, if the group gets too big, then it gets weird, you know, but it's like, oh, that's like a, a special thing that I'm a part of. But then behind all that is like, oh, we're just all running on the same, the same schematics, you know, for we're just a continuation of, of that same, that yeah. same uh, hereditary pattern, which I think is great. Yeah. In fact, uh, that reminds me of Dr. Gottman's research where he found that by studying micro expressions, he was able to predict whether couples would stay together even just yeah. with a minute or two of watching them, he could predict with 90 some percent accuracy if they were going to be together in five years time. It's so simple. So if you, I mean, if you give it a dang about uh, business or, you know, relationships, which is the same thing, uh, l really becoming sensitive to what are these little micro expressions? What is the meaning of all of these? And a great place to start with that is what is the meaning within my own? You know, so having, just the, the, a bit of introspection and kind of observing yourself throughout the day and being honest with yourself. You know, it's like, wow, like, as I'm walking down the street here, you know, it's like kind of my leg kind of drags behind me here and my, my glutes don't really feel very strong and my spine kind of curls in this direction and my shoulders kind of cover and protect a little bit and I've always got this tension in my wrist because I'm holding my cell phone so much and maybe I got that like resting bitch face furrowed brow type thing going on all the time. I'm like, what am I saying? You know, like, as I'm going through the world, like, what, why didn't that person, you know, why didn't I get that job? Why didn't that person think I was attractive? Why didn't, you know, why don't I, I 
financially successful, meeting the, like, the goals that I would like, was like, well, perhaps literally physically, you're within the confines of a body that says no. <laughs> you're within the confines of a body that's like that feels maybe like it's almost like a like a um, oh what is it what is the uh, what is it called when you're when you become in love with your captor um, something syndrome oh what is that um, I was it's just not Copenhagen like syndrome it's with something else yeah it's something Stockholm like Stockholm sweet uh, Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome. yeah exactly syndrome. yeah it's almost like you're like Stockholm syndrome with your own with your own physical patterns yeah you know you're like oh no 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 these patterns they get me through it's like no these patterns keep you stuck so I think a great starting point is really become honest, and 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 I have that a, a little exercise in my book actually, um, where you go through and give each major joint in your body. Um, I think I ask you to do like three adjectives, you know. So tell me how describe the the personality characteristics of your ankles, of your knees, of your hips, of your spine, of your shoulders, of your elbow, your neck, your head. You know, head's not a major joint, although there are a lot of joints within the head. Um, you know, and you go through and you get this collection of these personality traits, essentially, of your physical body. And what you'll find is like, oh, that's me. <laughs> you know, as you go through and you express the way that your body performs day to day or just is, performs kind of a funny word, um, what you have is yourself. You know, you have the way that you navigate the world. And so a great a great place is one just I think become really interested in what is the meaning of my my movement uh, beyond just do I deadlift more or bench press more or something, um, and then from there, uh, inevitably if you look at yourself enough you can't not see that in other people, you know so it's a really magical experience for you to have all sorts of seeming like dysfunctions in quotations or imbalances or injuries or anything like that everyone is a gift. You know, everyone is an opportunity for you to understand something deeper than you could had you not actually going into that rabbit hole of my back hurts or I'm experiencing depression or my, you know, my whatever the thing is, my knee hurts, all the things. It's like from there you have the opportunity to understand and empathize for people that are going down that, that path and then you can learn to march yourself back through it. And it becomes then from that point you're like, oh, cool, like, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm responsible, you know, like I'm responsible for this stuff. You know, as opposed to giving the uh, blaming all this stuff on other people, like I think coming back in and be like, no, like everything in my reality I created. All right, cool. All right, now from there I have a little bit of, of traction to move forward from that point. I know those are kind of like disparate, separate thoughts, but uh, you know, yeah, I think it's all connected. Yeah, that's really cool. So, uh, did you have any epiphanies while you were doing this process w with yourself? I presume that you went through and figured out all the different adjectives or states or whatever that you assigned to each of your joints. So any, yeah. any epiphanies there? Yeah, man. I mean, I've had a lot of stiffness around like my, my thoracic spine, like heart territory. You know, so, and, and that, that shows up in relationship where I have a bit of like, still lingering sensations of, of fear of commitment and um you know which would i think probably trickle back into uh you know like a fear of being left type mm -hmm. sensation you know and actually neil strauss and in, in my podcast he kind of like cracked open some some different nuggets in relation to that um and you know i think that, that it would make sense that i've kind of had this sensation of, of weight of sorts in and around thoracic spine heart territory um it's interesting man when like if you're like really in love you can literally like, feel it in your heart it's a very fascinating experience i mean you when you have those moments where you're like all the fluffy you know nonsensical meta new agey talk it's like like no bitch like you can feel it in your heart like you if you miss somebody and you really care like it's it's like it's it's in there you know, and you have various different neurons, just like you have in your brain, in and around the tissue of your heart, and around the tissue in your guts. When you have a gut feeling, it's like that is an extension of your brain. Yeah. You no. Know, so, so the idea, like, you are not just between your temporal lobes here. Like, you, you are your whole body. You know, and you're very clearly, at least your your visceral tissue, your heart, and your guts, and all that stuff. I would say, you know, you are much more than that as well. You are your your everything. Your 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 environment. I would say your your parents. I would say your your house. You know, that's that's what makes humans really interesting is our capacity to adapt to any environment. Um, you know, but that was an interesting thing for me was was 
if I'm honest, I think I've been a bit frozen in that part of my life. Um, and then that expresses itself in the way that I, I move through the world. And then there's all sorts of other compensatory patterns that manifest themselves as a product of being like, okay, perhaps there's some sensation of like not being, this is very kind of like fluffy, you know, new age therapy talk. Um, so I apologize in advance if there's any words that, that people are like, oh boy, tuning out. Um, you know, but that was, that was something that if I, if I'm honest with that, uh, that was a fascinating thing to look at and start almost like massaging open those spaces around the ribs. And, you know, that was a thing for me was, uh, going and getting massages. You know, I've been a body worker and, you know, a trainer and been helping with other people's bodies for, you know, the last, it's been, I think 17 years or something is like the origination of starting with doing that. Uh, but I never really got a lot of body work myself unless I was in schools or, you know, all that stuff or done trades with people. But I started going regularly and getting massage and specifically focusing on, cool, like up around the chest and the ribs and the back and the hips and like all those, those places that are so valuable. And just that action of being willing to be like, okay, like I'm worth being taken care of, which would probably resonate with a lot of people. You know, that's a really big deal. You know, so even if the massage is just a metaphor, whatever it is that gets you to be in that position where you're like, I am worth being taken care of. I don't need to be the savior. I don't need to show up and be the big, strong, heroic, whatever. I can just lay here and be taken care of, and that's completely fine. You know, so I think that that was something that was very valuable for me. Oh, that is so cool. And, and did you find that there was some healing or some breakthroughs that happened from the realization and from the body work that you went through, the massages and that? I don't know that there's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's tough to say, like, you know, the question of chicken or the egg with anything. I think everything, again, it's, it's the double helix thing. It's all this spirals circling back and sometimes they bump into each other, you know, and you're like, I feel like I'm in the same place, but at a higher level, you know, maybe I feel like I'm in the same place, but at a lower level, you know, but it's, I think it's these, these paths seem to be meandering, but then they eventually intersect. And, um, I think that the massage is as just as that as, as a singular example, um, would just be, uh, correlated to that general movement in that direction of starting to kind of really look and say like, where am I, you know, hurting? Where am I kind of stifling my own growth? Where am I afraid? You know, and I, I think that that's, I would say the massage was certainly helpful with that. I wouldn't necessarily say that like that was the reason that I feel like today I'm more in a position to actually fall in love with a person. Um, but and I actually have, like, recently been in a relationship with a person who was like, oh, I love you. And like, we love each other. Like, wow, like, that hasn't, I haven't felt really safe and good to say that for a decade, you know. And so that was, that's a pretty interesting thing to have that, to see that progression. Um, and I would say body work certainly is a major part of it. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily put all of the, that is like, that was the solution. I think that was a part of a, a general march. Gotcha. You know, I, I, I guess I would put these kinds of um, body therapies into two categories. Uh, the kind of temporary, uh, just maintenance type things, maybe they help for a little bit. I mean, cumulatively, I'm sure that's uh, a, a great help. But then there's stuff that will uh, just break you through, like just a one-time adjustment or... Uh, some session of some type can open a door and you're never the same again. I, I've, I've heard about Atlas therapy. I haven't done it, but apparently you only need to do it once. Uh, and, and that's mm. a kind of a, a special kind of maybe chiropractic adjustment, I guess. Uh, I've, I've had um, uh, oneness blessings that there was one in particular that was a spiritual awakening for me in, in, in India, and I was agnostic my whole life before that. So that was a, a permanent one-time uh, shift, breakthrough, uh, epiphany. Um, yeah. there, there are other modalities that offer those kinds of things. Um, I just had Dr. Barry Gillespie on the podcast recently, and he's the creator of... Um, cranial sacral fascial therapy cft and you can with one two maybe three sessions have a permanent breakthrough 
uh, and he specializes in, in babies, infants in particular, and, and uh, all the stress they go under through, through the birth. He can, uh, and, and the practitioners who practice CFT can cause a huge epiphany and, and breakthrough and, and, and kind of state shift with one adjustment, one, one session. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think like the human body, human experience is kind of like a ship, you know, and it's and it's moving in a direction, and um, sometimes you can, maybe in your life you might hit an iceberg or you might run into a big storm or you might have some big course correct where someone comes and says, hey, bud, your compass is off, like you're going in the wrong direction. We're gonna reset your compass, um, and within that though. Uh, I think in like the, the kind of like pharmaceutical allopathic culture that we in, as Westerners have kind of been indoctrinated in, that sounds really great, you know, to have those experiences where it's like, okay, like I did the, the one thing and then that was it. Um, but within that, I think that if you do that one thing and then your physical s- structure and perhaps your mind in that moment has shifted, but then you come back to the same relationship. Then you come back to the same house. You come back to the same car. You came back to the same job. You came come back to, you know, the that that mold that continually forms your sense of, you know, identity of self and your physical body and, you know, the the perhaps even like the chemicals and such in the in the in the your laundry detergent and the you know all the little the deodorant that you like all of those things they bring you back to your set point of where you were. So if you go to Peru and you do some major ayahuasca ceremony thing and you know, you've, you, you, you come back a new person and you're all light and shiny for the first week and people are like, Whoa, like what happened? You're like, man, ayahuasca, you know? And then, but then you go back and you, and you run those same repetitions of the same crap that you've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, good luck. You know, like with, with, with maintaining that shine. Yeah. You know, and so it's it's really it needs to be, you really need to look at this the system holistically, um, again not from like a new agey fluffy version of the word just you know wholly as in look at all of the different coordinates all the different angles in your world, you know and see like wow like maybe go home after you have one of those those shiny pearly magical angelic experiences and look at your closet, say like does this clothing, the colors of these clothes, the tightness, the, the fabrics, all of that stuff. Does this represent my ideal version of myself? Yeah. Yes or no? You know, go through like, well, I am out in the bed. Like, is this who I ideally want to be in? You know, if I could be anybody, you know, if I had two years, one year, whatever, like, is this it? If the answer is yes, like, cool, sweet, you're in great track. Uh, if the answer is no, like, adjust, throw it away, get rid of it. You know, give it a go. Like it'll help somebody else. Somebody else probably wants to be at that point in that expression of those colors. Let it go, you know, and come back and you know look at the paintings on your wall. Look at the shape of your house. You know, so it's like, oh wow, like that that couch. And then I have you know the the the, the coffee table in front of that. It's filled up with maybe you know a bunch of whatever photos of stuff maybe I don't care about or books that don't really relate to me or maybe I'm hanging on to some old stupid trophy from when I was a wrestler in high school or something whatever you're like I don't is this me anymore you're like what am I hanging on to here these memories of the past like why am I so attached to that shit um you know and then I have the big tv on the wall and I go in I'm like like what is this what is this mold create what kind of human organism does this mold create have I got the, the big couch got the table covered with stuff you know and then i got the tv in front of that and then i got the dinner table beside that and the chairs and then like that's my place my place is a is a, is a sitting habitat it's like a sitting zoo you know so i go in and I, and I collapse onto the couch and i stare into the wall you know and then i go and i hunch into the blue lit refrigerator and i pull out some processed foods and you know i put them in the microwave and then i sit down on my my table at another 90 degree angle with my hips and my knees and my ankles the same position i've been since you know i woke up in the morning off of my raised bed and then i got into my car and then i went to the office and sat and stared at the screen and then i got back into the car and then i went to the gym and i did the sitting workout machine things then i got back into the car and i was like whoa and then you top off the day with netflix And then you, and then you, and then you're like, man, I could really use a sit on a comfy chair this time and stare into a bigger screen in my house with, you know, the air perfectly set to 69 degrees or whatever. 
And it's like, dude, if you were a zoo animal, which you are, 100%, you are a, 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 a wild homo sapien that's been placed into this really fascinating zoo habitat. You'd be like, what the hell kind of animal are you forming in that environment? Is that what your ideal version of yourself would be if you were a six-year-old kid pretending to be Batman in your backyard? You know, climbing trees and rolling through piles of leaves and be like, man, if I could be anything, I'd want to be that hunched over, you know, stuck in hip flexion zoo animal. Like, that's my shit. Absolutely. You're like, no, be a hero. You know, change that up. Yeah, you know, and you don't need to, you don't need to do anything crazy. You don't need to buy a muscle car and you know go 130 miles down the road to be a hero. Like you can start just taking care of yourself at a cellular level. You know, maybe when instead of being in that same hunch, over this gets into like what my book's all about. But being in that that same sitting position that for whatever reason we've got placed into since like age five. You know, you learn to be a cog in a in a in a bigger system. You learn to like work your way up the, the, the corporate hierarchy, you know, from age five. Before that, you have all this amazing imagination and adventure and sense of wonderment. And then you're like, okay, all of that stuff means you're sick. If you're sitting in that chair inside that air-conditioned room, staring into those books and now staring into those screens, you know, wearing out your eyes and like your, your body at a cellular level is saying, please feed me sun and adventure please like i'm dying you know and then within that system if you're if you start to listen to those cells speak up now all of a sudden the guidance counsel and the teacher's like oh man this boy is sick <laughs> like we we need some meds we need to temper this thing yeah you know and then you yeah, go acting through up that or system. acting out but they're just he's being acting, a kid he's acting yeah what's he acting out about yeah i think he's yeah what's going on here you know, and then from there we start labeling all of these different things, and then we get the what is the manual called? The DHM, DH, DSM. You know, the the the, the psychiatric manual telling you like if you do this and that and that, then you have this disorder essentially. You know, and oh, you know, he's got he's got maybe he's got uh, ADHD, and maybe he's got oh, and now it's all of a sudden he's feeling anxious. So what's this anxiety about? Um, I think maybe he needs some anxiety medication. Oh, he seems sad now. Oh shit. Okay, I think we need to get him something for that. It's like if you go against that inner urge to do all of those things that I think that you know young kids naturally kind of lean towards, uh, the, the the human the animal will act up. And so I, I think that that roundabout way of saying come back in a, like a really um, immediate way, the way that, to 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 make heroic changes in your life is just examining your home environment would be a great starting point. Yeah. You know, maybe make your workstation maybe make your workstation near a window and open it. You know, and have have some some fresh air come in. So you can breathe in the, the phytoncides and the various chemicals that, that boost your immune system, which is like such a big deal now. You know, it's so like why don't we actually do the things that that help condone a healthy immune system right now? You know, expose your your eyeballs to sun, expose your skin to take your shirt off, man. You know, wear some shorts like get get barefoot like ex, like you need nature that's what you like you are nature like you you need to have that grounding you need to have good water you need to be able to breathe fresh air you need to be able to move your body in a full range of motion um you know it's, it's very simple and pretty darn close to free uh to to really nurture the human body uh, but we kind of get wrapped up in the need that we need to reach out you know and purchase something that maybe we can't afford in order to to be healthy yeah all the not, time. that's not true <laughs> you know just yeah exactly you know coming through and, and just eating your your bagel and cream cheese or your fish locks or whatever you do in the morning uh maybe instead of sitting on the dinner table like like a good adult american maybe why don't you go out to your back porch you know or front or you know anywhere you get yourself a little like cushion and sit your butt all the way down on the ground like your ancestors have done forever and people that still have healthy hips and knees and ankles still do all around the world. It's much more common for you to squat and kneel and go into, you know, we call them in the book, we call them archetypal positions of repose. Those positions that you've naturally done forever, um, they literally they act as tuning mechanisms for your, for your whole entire body. 
You know, and so throughout the day, you're, you're holding certain positions to be a specialist in whatever it is that you do. Now you need to, that's essentially like untuning the guitar in a sense. Those positions that you naturally would come back to where you lay down and you open up, you sprawl out on the ground. Maybe you roll over. Maybe you squat down in your haunches for a little bit. Maybe you kneel for a second. You're gathering water or washing your clothes by a river, whatever you would do. You know, all of those positions, they literally start to flush all of those joints with new synovial fluid and they move some, uh, lymphatic fluid and circulate your blood and you know they turn your brain on you know so all of those positions like the body knows what to do we just have so much momentum kind of going against those natural reflexes i know that was a very long rant i apologize <laughs> well i want to uh I, I thought of a few different things i wanted to mention as you were talking one is i i realized during the 40 years of Zen process that I did, which was a week-long program in uh, the Seattle area, it's um, it's a company run by uh, Dave Asprey, or you know, owned, owned by D Dave Asprey, the bulletproof coffee guy, and and uh, uh, it was transformative. It was incredibly powerful. It unlocked memories I hadn't had since. I don't know, in 40 some years, memories from my early childhood. It was so cool. And I didn't maintain and uh, water the new flowers. When I got back, I didn't develop a, a routine or regimen of uh, daily meditations or anything like that. So essentially I trampled over all those uh, new little flowers and, and didn't leverage that uh, very expensive investment in that 40 right. year, years of Zen program, which is unfortunate. But it's, it's a, a great example of what you were describing of uh, getting your environment and your rituals and everything to be um, uh, in, in, in synchrony or uh, get, get it aligned with yeah. the big transformation you just had. Uh, and within with, within that, you know, it's like I find some of those things to be somewhat alienating for people that aren't like super wealthy. Um, you know, not to say that you are alienated by talking about that. You're just interested and you want to explore and see what kind of potentials you can find out in this in this experience. Um, but nobody needs those experiences. Like you can you can go. I mean, one you can get a. There's there's all sorts of now. It's becoming legalized to explore, you know, psilocybin therapy and MDMA therapy and, you know, ketamine therapy. And there's, there's, there's ways to, to travel, uh, that aren't that they're, they're fairly cost effective that you can explore from your, you know, your, your, your town, or maybe you could go to whatever town that actually exists. Uh, and then beyond that, I think there's just, we just need to shake up the snow globe. You know, everything gets set in place. And then you're like, okay, I'm, I'm in my tunnel. I'm going to keep going forward. This is what I care about. It's like, I don't even know if you know what you care about. You know what you care about from that position that you've formed over the last however long. You know, but if you get shaken up, like if I, you know, I'm planning on, on moving to uh, Austin, Texas in a little bit. And then I'm planning on traveling for the winter is, is the plan. We'll see you know, what, what the world has in store for me. Um, but in those situations, I really value relocating myself for any amount of time. Because in that, that time, you really have the opportunity to, you know, take the things that, that served you, you know, and leave the things behind that didn't, and then, you know, create what's genuinely, you realize like a Bruce Lee quote, uh, you know, so in those opportunities, you have that, you have that, the, the ability to say like, wow, like this is, I'm on a totally new canvas right now. Crazy. What if I paint with yellow? What if I paint with, I'm going to draw this weird kind of spinny tree thing it's like a, it looks like a like a van gogh painting it's like wow like what's i never thought i could do that was well, because you were so built up within that 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 previous canvas there was already so many colors on the palette you know and so i think that that having the opportunity and that's why meditation is, is a really powerful tool as well it's 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 the the active version of of clearing the palette in a sense or at least at least reducing the amount of weight that you put into each color on the palette and you know, if you meditate long enough you see the, the color come in and you're like oh well, i've seen that color come in six thousand times you know and saying the exact same thing but instead of me attaching to it and causing me to run to the fridge or run to my cell phone and text that person or you know run to whatever i'm just going to watch it 
You know, if you sit back and watch it enough, eventually, inevitably, it loses that that strength that it has over you. It's very fascinating that we have that ability. Um, but in the world that we live in, um, auto- truly autonomous human creatures that don't feel dependent on outside forces in order to feel well, um, that's not very good for consumerism. You know, if you're selling stuff, you want a bunch of people that feel enslaved to purchasing crap in order to feel well. And so it's a very strange kind of mix of, of currents kind of going against each other. There's like the you that has everything that you've ever needed already. And then there's that's riding right alongside the you that feels like you need to have at least a million dollars in the bank to, to be a man and feels like you need to have, you know, at least this many cars and feels like you need to have this hot a wife or girlfriend or whatever. And feels like you need all these things. And then, Oh, wow. Oh, I finally, I'm finally made. I'm, 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 I'm good enough. I'm enough. You know, and it's like, uh, there are two opposing forces. <laughs> and if you do put enough weight into that place where you do clear that palette, then you start to see that force and then you can start to generate compassion for that force. And you say, man, like, wow. You can have compassion for yourself. Like, man, I've been a slave for the last 30 years. Like, that's great. I've been a slave to, you know, all these things that maybe were like socially acceptable addictions, money, power, women, you know, men, whatever, whatever your thing is. Uh, but if you could step back beyond that and be like, man, I've been just so flippant attached to all of these external things in order to feel okay. You know, and I, I think that it's, it's a majorly supportive thing that a, a person can do for themselves is just giving them the opportunity, almost like a forced snow globe shake. You know, maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's, you know, biannually, maybe it's annually, whatever you can, shake your snow globe, you know, and step back and see what pieces, where the pieces fall, you know, and give yourself enough spaciousness in your life, whatever that looks like to you. It could be travel, it could be whatever you're into. Um, give yourself enough spaciousness to really examine and say, okay, I, I really, I, I value this piece, this piece I want to keep on the board, you know, but these other three pieces, like, I don't think I need them. In fact, I feel way lighter without those pieces of myself, what I deemed to be myself. But in fact, they were just these external kind of addictions, you know, and then from there, I think that's, uh, that with consistency, you're going to have a pretty cool human organism. You're going to have a pretty cool human experience. You know, but if you just stay kind of stuck in the same board and you think that's the only board that you have the option to play um, for your whole life, maybe you got lucky and you got a good board, but probably not. <laughs> you know, it's unlikely that the first board you got was like the best board to play. I think it's, it's a good idea to, to kind of shuffle the pieces around with regularity and see what sticks. For sure. And so what was the latest snow globe shake that you did? Oh, I mean, we're humanity is going through a global snow globe shake right now. You know, so, so with the you know the whole protests and riots and you know all of the kind of pe- the turmoil amongst people on in in real life on social media, uh, you know, people just turning against each other. You know, people are just angry. There's like there's like there's anger. You know, and it's like if it's like it's like the what is it the Kubler Ross stages of grief. You know, we go through. I think we're culturally we're going through some we're going through some degree of stages of grief. You know, the first is like denial, and then you go into um, I think anger, and then eventually it's like I forget what they are in order right now. Depression, and eventually you get to acceptance. There's five of them, um, but it's irrelevant what the specific the specific steps are i don't know they it's a perfect overlay as far as what culture is going through but i think that we're going through some degree of like stages of grief of perhaps grieving over you know a past way of living in a sense maybe there's like you know maybe the world's going toward towards like this technological direction maybe you know i think that there's like an era this is going to be a pretty pivotal era shift i think i think there's going to be before covid after covid yeah you know and i think that we, I think within that, there's a lot of people that are probably just like, ah, I was like, Dude! you know, and then there's, there's oppression and you know, there's so many different layers of things going on right now. And I can't work. I can't go to work, you know, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to do, will I even have a job? You know, will I be able to feed my kid? Will I be able to feed myself? All of those dreams that I had had gone, you know, not gone, transitioned, you know, but like, that's like, Fuck, like that's worth grieving over as a society, I think. You know, and um, you know, so I'm I'm a part of society, and so I've I think I've had an experience of 
um, just a, a lot more than is typical kind of observing of like what the hell actually matters. What do I actually care about? Do I care about my podcast? Do I care about my book? Do I care if anybody reads the book? Do I care if anybody listens to this conversation? Like, do I, what, what does it matter? You know, and being able to step back from that and look is like, I think it's a really healthy place to be. It can be dangerous because you can kind of lean towards kind of like nihilistic, apathetic, depressive type direction, which is fine to explore, you know, but ideally like that's not the color I'd like to stay, you know, stuck with on the, on the, on the, on the canvas. Um, but I want to have a little bit of that on the canvas because I want to stay grounded. I want to stay real and have, have those perspectives of like, yeah, maybe nothing matters, you know, and I think that's a, that's a healthy thing to examine. Um, but I think that's, that's a place that I've been at over the last, you know, since March, I guess, is kind of like, what do I actually care about? You know, and, and now within that, there's the, the physical outward expression of that now is, okay, I want to get rid of everything that I own, um, in my like physical, you know, around me world. There's other things that I, that I technically own beyond like my immediate world. Um, but they don't bother me and they're just, they're, they're they're profitable and beneficial to, to making my life be more free, which is, which is nice. Um, but as far as the material possessions that I have in front of me here, the sauna behind me and, you know, all the crap inside my apartment and whatnot, I'd like to get rid of all of that. Um, and I'm going to transition to another place for a little bit and have, you know, essentially like a backpack and have my, my grand snow globe shake of, you know, I haven't done it for four years. And so I've been feeling the itch to do that. So, that's where I'm at now is, is my material world is going down close to zero and uh, I'm going to change my geographical location and uh, see you know, what sticks from that. Wow. So what about your clients, the athletes, the celebrities? Oh, I don't. That's, that's fine. I mean, that's, there, there's <laughs> that's clients fine. everywhere. That's not. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah. I think that the best thing that I can do is, um, you know, I think lead by example of kind of going through the the patterns is what feels like intuitively like the, the best freest thing to do um, and freedom can be having anchor I think I think that's a big part of freedom is, is having a good anchor I don't think if you just being you know like becoming some monk and moving out in the mountains and and having no possession I don't think that's ideal like freedom per se it could be for an individual but your level your idea of freedom could be having a big mansion and having a harem and having six cars in the drive that could be freedom to you my idea of freedom is is more like i i want to open up as much bandwidth as i can um in other directions by minimalizing my my physical kind of distractions as far as like my material stuff that's just where i'm at now though everybody's got a different idea of freedom whatever makes you feel free go for it Mm, okay and, and yeah. <laughs> I, i'm curious like uh where did you get the inspiration to to try this was it a, a certain book like essentialism or, or some sort of a minimalist documentary or like what what inspired this probably the, the the people that i appreciate most as far as from like a philosophical perspective and such and i like listen to like ram Dass a lot and i like listen to alan watts a lot and I listen to people that they've been brainwashing me for many, many years, I think, to kind of lean towards more minimalistic way of life. Um, so that could be a part. I've probably been brainwashed by listening to like lots and lots of hours of those people speaking into my ears because of the power of podcasts and audio books and, and book books. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, I just, for a long time, I've always felt much better by it a state of flexibility and fluidity and <clears throat> the ability to to change directions if I want to. That's not necessarily means that I that I will, but I, I like to have that openness, the ability of like and even if it's an illusion, you know, mm -hmm. it's still it's it's nice to have the illusion of like, oh yeah, like I can I can I can do what I want. You know, I don't know. I think that's a natural thing for the most part. Are are you gonna continue podcasting? Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well so that's so that's the the difference Previously, I'd done many, well, not many, I did like five trips um, in my 20s where I would leave for, you know, like six months. And I would just either, one time I did a motorcycle trip where I went down through Mexico and Central America and then circled back up. 
Um, that was like a seven month long kind of saga of like living in a hammock and living on beaches and, you know, doing all sorts of, you know, strange stuff. And, you know, it did a bunch of one way tickets to random places around the world and kind of just like see what would happen. And, um, during that time frame, I didn't have the book. I didn't have the podcast. I didn't have like, a, you know, any kind of platform on the internet. And so now I'm very excited to, cause that, that's, it's convenient to be able to do that, but it's also nice to be able to continue building something, you know, and have something that's like, cool, I've worked on this for you know, the last 10 years and it doesn't just all just disappear. You know, so I think that the internet allows the ability to, um, explore in that way and still have, still be able to kind of like nurture that garden that you've been working on, which is very convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah. are, are there any particular modalities or, or, um, I don't know, disciplines, things that you're going to, uh, bring with you or, uh, practice while you're on th these, uh, on these journeys. Like, I don't know, for example, exactly what rolfing is, but I, I, uh, I think that's something that, that you have some experience in, if that's correct. I mean, rolfer, yeah, you're rolfing, rolfer. rolfing, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it's a form of, of hands-on body work or manual therapy. And um, I describe it as kind of like if you if you melded together physical therapy and massage therapy, you'd probably have s some degree of what could be deemed rolfing. Um, but essentially, it's working with connective tissue or, or fascia uh, and with an, an eye for what's happening structurally with the whole entire body. And so when you go see maybe certain massage therapists, you might be working much more site specific. They're rubbing, you know, your back as your back hurts or whatever. Um, from a more structural integration perspective or rolfing perspective, structural integration is like a, a bigger word for rolfing. You're looking at what's the orientation of the foot in relation to the knee in relation to the hips in relation to the neck in relation to the swing of the arms. So you're really looking the, the goal with structural integration or rolfing is to get the body oriented. <clears throat> the language I use in my book is aligned so that essentially your existence by you living inside of your body, the way that you walk, the way that you breathe, the way that you look, the way that you, you know, inhabit yourself, it makes you healthier by, by being, you're not continually creating these friction fires because of various misalignments throughout the body. So the end goal of, of rolfing or structural integration is to integrate or reorient the body in such a way that the body starts to heal itself. Um, and that sounds perhaps kind of magical, but it's actually like very logical. <laughs> you know, it's like <clears throat> if you have a bunch of hoses throughout your body and there's a bunch of crimps, there's a crimp at the knee and there's a crimp at the hips and there's a crimp at the neck and there's a crimp in the wrist, how would you expect for the, the circulation of all those those fluids to circulate throughout that body? It'd be kind of crummy. You know, so the intention of structural integration is to open up those kinks, and the focus is through working with connective tissue or fascia. So is that something that um, you teach people through your online programs and through the book to do themselves? Yeah. Or do they need somebody uh, to yeah. do a, a rolfer to do that uh, to them? for them. No, I, I teach people how to do the, the work with themselves and I teach people how to, how to reorient their, their physical environment in such a way that their environment, you know, makes them more flexible and taller and more confident and, you know, all the things that you'd ideally like to be probably, um, unless you're like super emo, you know, and you really like going into the darkness, like that's cool too. <laughs> whatever you're, whatever you're into, I think is great. Um, you know, and so, that's what the book focuses on is giving people the, the, the tools on essentially how to drive your body. You know, so we didn't really get that education. We learned how to, you know, you got a permit to drive our car and you know, if you want to get a gun, you got to go take a, depending upon what state you're in, you know, you want to take a test and you got to go through and understand how to work all the doohigs and the safeties and the triggers and this and that, uh, you got to be able to clean it. You know, like we don't really oddly get that with the physical body, which is in my mind, super, super interesting, but that's not a, a bigger focus. Um, so it's essentially what I did with the book and the online program is I gave people the, the fundamentals, like the nuts and bolts, the things that you need to know, uh, on how to really effectively be in your body in daily life. And what's the name of the book? The Align Method. The Align Method. Okay. Cause you keep talking about the book, but you never use the title of the book. And when, when you're, talking Oh about yeah, it. right. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, maybe I should. That's, that, oh, you that's should a good cue. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta learn better. The Align Method. Yeah, the Align Method. I wouldn't call it Align, but the publishers wouldn't let me, so it's the Align Method. But that's fine. I mean, yeah. it is there, there, there is, there is methodology of it, but I kind of am a little bit more like Bruce Lee-ish with my ideas of a method. You know, it's like it's much bigger than that. It's more like a philosophy and a way of life. Um, you know, so that's that's the name of the book, but the the contents are much much more of like a way of life than like a specific method. Gotcha. And what's the name of your online program? The Align Method. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's broken down. Thanks, Russ. That's broken down in, in, in the six-week segments. And um, we just relaunched the new version of it, which is this, like version 3.0, maybe 4.0. Um, and everyone, you know, we're just so much more stoked about. This one, I'm like, oh, this is great. Like, I'm like really, really excited. Um, you know, and so I'm, it's an interesting thing, like having iterations of, of, of things. I think with people listening to this, something that's might be like encouraging is, you know, you just need to get an iteration out, you know, like you need to have a step one, you know? And so when you get that out, then it's like, ah, oh, okay, cool. You can stand back and you can look at it and say, okay, that didn't really quite work. This, all right. So I got feedback from people saying like, they loved that. They didn't like that. Then you shake the snow globe up again. You know, and then you come back and you let the pieces fall again. You know, so creating an online program, creating a book, creating, you know, anything your, yourself. I think it's it's all how you do anything is how you do everything. You know, and so I think having that opportunity, to just like get something out on the canvas and then be able to stand back and examine it. You know, and that's what we've done with the online program. It's now we're we're at I think canvas number four with it, and we're I think we're finally like cool. Like I think we're good on that. Like it's 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 really good. I'm proud of it. That's awesome. And uh, I understand you have uh, a free masterclass for our yep. our listeners. Do you want to tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh, breaks down the fundamentals of what every person um, ideally could be doing in their daily life to open up their hips is a big thing, and also helping with getting the neck and shoulders kind of coming out of that like staring at my cell phone staring at my computer position you know so we break down basic fundamentals of, of exactly how to do that uh, and then we touch on a few other parts of of the book essentially of uh, one of the things would be like getting into s s how to use your eyes in such a way that literally gives you more energy um, or calms you down or focuses you you know so this we didn't touch on this we could you know but it's it's kind of a, a big pandora's box of conversation but your eyes are literally, they're an extension of your brain. And so when you are staring into your phone or staring into your screen or you know, inside closed walls all day long, it's kind of a bit activating for the nervous system. It's kind of putting you into a place of like, okay, like focus, you know, I'm looking down at the animal or the, you know, the prey in, in nature and I'm going to, I'm going to hunt the, I'm pulling the bow back and I've got all my energy on that. We're in that myopic vision. We're really focused in. It tunes our nervous system. It kind of tunes us up. Um, you know, a really powerful tool that people like a little takeaway is if you want to calm your nervous system, uh, use your panoramic vision, you know, so look out into the distance, take a break, look out the window, ideally get actual real full spectrum sunlight to connect with your eyes. Uh, you don't need to like look up at the sun in the middle of the day, uh, but just going out and not wearing sunglasses all day long is a really valuable thing like your 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 eyes literally grow, they change shape from that. Um, it's a, at least in part the reason that modern culture is is leaning towards myopia or, or short sightedness because we're lacking that that little that that reaction that chemical reaction that manifests a product of getting sun, um, you know. So that's it's a big deal if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling anxious, <clears throat> if you want to just feel generally have a little energy boost, uh, just look out the window, <laughs> and then compound that with maybe taking a walk. You know, and instead of taking a walk and looking down at your phone, which will rev you up, intentionally taking the trees, taking the clouds. You know, if you are in a room and you're feeling stressed out, you can kind of allow your vision to go a little bit, like space out for a second, going into that panoramic vision. Even though you can't look out into the distance, you can still take in the whole room, and that will literally tie back into your autonomic nervous system and start to calm you down a little bit. Um, that's so. so that's why you get separate. zoom fatigue. Is because you're so focused on. The yeah. people in, in on your conference call for yeah. a solid hour, and then you have another <laughs> Zoom call and another Zoom call. I'll have maybe five, six Zoom calls in a day. That's a typical day. Right. 
and it's yeah, exhausting. So, so, so there's a, there's a lot of levels to that one. There's like a, you know a backup of of you in your body, like you want to be cycled out. You know, so all of your all of the lymphatic fluids and all of the you know the the fluids that are circulating through your body, like they want to move. You know, and then another thing is you literally you, you create energy in your body through movement. You know, it's piezoelectricity. When you when you create when you walk when you bang your arm against a you know a, a side of a desk or anything like that, that's literally it's like a little lightning bolt through that bone. You know, and so by you moving your body, you are actually generating electricity. You're actually generating energy. You know, and so by you being stagnant and sitting in place all day, you know that's how a if you leave and you know, I have a, a motorcycle that I'm uh, selling as well. Um, that motorcycle, if it sits too long, then the battery goes dead. You know, so the human body is that battery in, in many senses. And you know, if you sit too long, the battery starts to get drained. And now simultaneously, you're staring into this screen, which, you know, evolutionarily speaking, your body's like, okay, this, I, he really needs, he really needs my adrenal glands and everything to show up for me right now. Cause he's really focused on this thing. You know, and so it's it's like the perfect storm for you to start to feel a little bit, uh, you know, lagging afterwards. Yep, understood. So, uh, this masterclass, how, how do our listeners get access to it? And uh, is there any kind of you guys special offer code or anything like that they need to know as well? You guys have have the link for it. I think Shayla sent you over all the stuff. But alignpodcast.com has, you know, you know, that's the first thing you'll see. And then also on the Instagram, Align Podcast, um, the link for it is in the bio. So it's really easy to find. Okay, perfect. And I'll include it in yeah. the show notes as well. So we'll uh, yeah. make sure that our listeners can get access to this awesome masterclass. And then hopefully they'll take the next step and also... Sign up for your Align Method uh, online program, get your book, subscribe to your Align podcast. And, uh, Thanks, man. Yeah, perfect. So thank you so much for joining us today, Aaron, and sharing uh, your wisdom and, and insights and, and knowledge and expertise and being vulnerable with us too, sharing uh, the stuff about your heart and, and opening up and, and all that. That was really, really cool. So thank you. Thanks for making it happen, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good, that's a good, a good thing. There's like fake vulnerability, which is quite annoying, especially living in LA. That's like, that's like, Oh man, like people will like you more if you like lead with vulnerability. So you kind of have this, you know, spiritual bypassing, like vulnerable bypassing layer on the outside. Um, you know, which is fine. Uh, but I think that's people, something that you can do it's very simple is kind of lead more with just like being honest and what feels like relevant and real for you and then that gives the permission for other people to do the same and then step by step we're in a world that you know i think all of us want to spend more time in <laughs> you know? for so sure i appreciate you making making the space for it all right well thank you so much aaron thank you listeners now take some action and apply some of what you've learned in this episode and we'll catch you next week on Get Yourself Optimized.